I'm thrilled to welcome to the stage someone who was a true pioneer in the fight for civil rights. He demonstrated tremendous courage as he joined the sit-in at the Woolworths Diner, and he continues to inspire us with this message of freedom and conservative values. With a rich background as a church elder, a teacher, a college administrator, entrepreneur, and motivational speaker, our guest today has a unique and valuable perspective on the challenges facing society today. So without further ado, let's give a warm welcome to the one and only Clarence Henderson. Clarence, so we're honored to have you here, here with us today. Can you tell those who are watching via our live stream, our audience, um, for those who may not be familiar with you, tell us a little bit about your background and your accomplishments. Well, uh, I was born in a little place called Townville, South Carolina, moved to Greensboro, North Carolina, uh, when I was about five or six years of age, and uh, never went to an integrated school. Went to a segregated school uh, all of my life. And uh, one, of, one of the protectors that I dealt with was uh, Woolworths. I grew up in a time called Jim Crow, which meant separate but equal. My question always has been, if we're equal, why would we be separate? And so as I visited Woolworths when I was uh, a child growing up, they had uh, the public place and they had uh, separation there. Downstairs, they had two water fountains, one saying color and one saying white. And then they also had uh, uh, two bathrooms, one saying color and one saying white. And when the, I saw the water come out of the water fountains, I wondered what the difference was because it looked the same. If you went upstairs, you had uh, a, a, a counter there where you could uh, take um, food, but you had to, we had to get it to go. It cost the same thing. So in 1960, I had the opportunity to participate in one of the greatest movements of all time was the Civil Rights Movement, where we put Jim Crow on trial and Jim Crow was found guilty. And we did it according to um, uh, the belief and understanding that we were to do peaceful protests as opposed to violent protests. And uh, some of the things that I have participated in, I have uh, been honored by the president, former president on two different occasions. Uh, I'm the former chairman for the Martin Luther King Commission for the state of North Carolina. Received a long leaf pine also and uh, um, by the governor, former governor of the state of North Carolina. So my life has been one, a very rich one. And so I believe in uh, freedom, liberty and justice for all. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, we all know that the civil rights movement is um, one of the most pivotal movements in, in our society. And I wanted to um, highlight the fact that we are going to be talking about black excellence tonight. Um, welcome once again to Blexit Talks, where uh, we invite people from uh, all different walks of life and we um, highlight different topics that affect our culture today. So again, tonight's topic is black excellence. Um, it's my pleasure to introduce our next guest, this gentleman is a multi-talented individual who wears many hats as a political commentator, a business owner, an advocate for entrepreneurship. And uh, he's made a name for himself via his support of the First Step Prison Reform Act and urban, urban revitalization programs. And he's proud to be a founding member of the Blexit Foundation chapters. So uh, as a firm believer in capitalism, faith, freedom, and the American dream, he's here to share his insights and experiences with us. So let's give a warm welcome, you guys, to Osiga Kaku. Thank you, Sage. And um, yeah, it's definitely uh, an honor to uh, share the stage with uh, my good friend Bryson Gray and Mr. Uh, Clarence Henderson. Um, I am born and raised in Greensboro as well uh, to immigrant parents. I'm a big uh, supporter of entrepreneurship and just not always doing what's popular in society and fulfilling a need and just a fulfilling life. Uh, with the First Step Prison Reform Act, I kind of accidentally got involved in it when I had a uh, business advisor who had went to uh, prison for tax evasion, which uh, it affects a lot of people who do not, it's their first time making that amount of money through business or facing that uh, as far as tax uh, purposes and whatnot. And I remember I mentioned it to a few friends that were in the conservative movement and um, miraculously, one day they told me about this First Step Prison Reform Act and that they were, lob they were lobbying for it uh, in DC. And they would ask if I would like to help uh, some of the lobbyists with one of the organizations that's uh, known to Blexit and in the conservative movement. 
So I, you know, I hopped on a phone call and I just looked over the first, the first step act and I liked it. I, I pointed out, you know, many pointers about the program, such as it, it gives people a chance to, to get back into the real world and it gives them, uh, you know, a chance to whether start their own business and overcome, you know, barriers to entry along with the barriers that they have with being convicts. And urban revitalization, uh, similar thing too. It helps, allows people to kind of buy back the block in a sense and have uh, funding or the resources to start something in their communities. Uh, and uh, that, was, that was it in short. And through that work, around about three years ago in February for Black History Month, uh, we got different calls and contacts uh, and people were telling me to check my email. And I checked my email and it was the uh, it was a letter from the White House and by, an, an invitation uh, so, you know, I went there at the time, you know, I was, I was, uh, I guess, a baby conservative and I didn't know what to expect. I go there and it was the opposite of what the media would tell us about the former president. And to my surprise, uh, it was like the speech was tailored towards me and, you know, black people and even locally because he had a speaker uh, coming up next and it was Mr. Clarence Henderson as he was uh, inviting and introducing uh, Mr. Henderson, I was like, this guy sounds familiar. And uh, he came and he came up and he spoke. I was like, wow, I know that guy from Greensboro. You know, uh, I, was, I was like a, a little elementary school kid uh, and this man is literally in our textbooks. And to say, you know, to sh share the stage with him in a panel, to say it, it's, a, it's an honor is an understatement. Absolute <laughs> honor. Uh, you know, I, was, I always used to call my grandmother, who was born in 1923, a walking history book. Um, totally. So we need to make sure that we take advantage of the people that we have walking amongst us that, that have historical facts literally in their heads. Uh, because what we're being taught in school is, is not, it's, it's not the full story, it's not the real story. So, uh, and what it must have been an amazing experience for you to be, um, to actually, ex to, to be involved in the First Step Act. It's really, really oh, important yeah. that uh, criminal justice, especially to Blexit. So thank you. Uh, so it's time to welcome our final guest of the day, a 30-time Billboard chart-topping artist and America's most censored rapper. His hit song, Let's Go Brandon, dominated the iTunes charts, surpassing even Adele. A social media powerhouse known for speaking his mind, it's Bryson Gray. Welcome, Bryson Gray. What is up? How are you doing today, I'm Sage? doing pretty good. Thank you, Amazing. Bryson. Amazing. Um, so a bit about myself, born and raised in High Point, North Carolina. Um, I live in Tennessee now, though. Roy Cooper won again. I had to get up out of there. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but um, so I've been making music all of my life. I, I wish I could tell you when I started making music, but I, I literally can't. because I don't remember. Like I wasn't conscious enough to remember when I started making music. Ever since I've known me, I've been doing it. Um, I used to make secular, degenerate music, of mm. course, un ungodly music. Um, and I got very popular locally where I'm from, had songs on the radio. I was on 106 in Park when I was in high school. Um, I, had a, I had songs in movies. We had to sue the people because they didn't get, pay us for the songs in the movies. Um, had the number one song on radio in uh, North Carolina. Um, and we had, I had so many almost moments and I always thought like, dang, how are we not like multi-platinum by now? You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. But I feel like God had a different like plan with me. You know what I'm saying? So um, I just started getting closer to my faith. I was a, I've always been a Bible bumper, mm -hmm. but I was like a hypocrite at first. You know, I would Bible bump in the day and get drunk at nighttime. Ten shots pull me up. You feel wow, me? yeah. And then in the, mor in the morning, though, you feel me? I'm like, y'all better read this Bible. You know what I'm saying? Right. But um, <laughs> I started getting louder about my faith and started getting um, more into the Word and started changing act like my actual life, too, instead of telling other people to change theirs. And, um, and then I started getting in, in politics. Mm -hmm. And uh, when I started uh, getting into that, pitting on my red hat, I started getting like threats where I'm from. Um, so, you know, when that started happening, I was like, OK, so I bought a big one, a big mega hat and mm -hmm. went around everywhere with it. Like any, any place somebody said I couldn't go, I went there with it because I'm just not I'm not I'm not I'm not him. Right. You know what I'm saying? So uh, I started being more loud about politics and faith than the radio station, 102 Jams. <clears throat> in North Carolina, I had to say their name. Um, they actually, <laughs> they actually stopped rocking with me um, because of my views, and it was making my parents upset because they thought I was throwing my music career away for something 
that was irrelevant. In their eyes, like politics was irrelevant. And in their eyes, with my faith, I can keep it to myself. You know what I'm saying? So everybody can tell me to fake it till you make it. And I just always like, nah, because that's faith. You know what I'm saying? Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Like, like, you can't be fake. So I started making it, uh, making whatever I wanted to make. Uh, started making music for God. I started adding my political twang to it. And now I got, I've been on Billboard 30 times. Uh, and I'm more popular than I've ever been. So everybody was wrong. <laughs> <laughs> and, and it's a beautiful thing that you chose to follow your heart and follow, you know, the wisdom of God that, that you have within you. Um, and now you're on the billboard. Yes. You know, just against Adele. It's amazing. God first. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So our first topic today is school choice. So uh, I'm going to ask some questions uh, on this topic. First question is, um, for those unfamiliar, a lot of people in our community do not know what school choice is. What is school choice, Osiga? Yeah, so it's, uh, it's funny because school choice, it ties into uh, what we're going into next, which is free markets and entrepreneurship. So what school choice is, is it gives uh, parents the right to, to choose a school instead of having to only go to the district school, uh, the neighborhood school. So they can go to a charter school. They can go, of course, to private home school or other alternative schools or yeah, different schools within the, the school district. And uh, what, it, what it does is when a school, when a public school loses a certain amount of students, they lose certain funding. So it gives them the incentive, uh, which a lot of government agencies don't have this incentive. Uh, it gives them the incentive of uh, performing better and teaching the students better because if they lose the students, they lose, they lose funding. Um, which is tied into business, which, like I said, you rarely see uh, with uh, any government agency. And so school choice just gives parents, you know, power, and it helps educate, educate uh, children a little bit better and gives you options. Absolutely. Free markets. <laughs> yeah, so, so uh, it's important for everybody to also understand school choice breaks that link mm -hmm. between where a family is able to afford a home and the quality of education that they're able to receive, right? So school choice is very, very important. And, and if you don't know much about it, I encourage you to obviously listen to us, but educate yourself on that topic and, and everybody you know around you because education is, is very important. Um, so how does school choice benefit the students and the parents? Um, well, it benefits the students because schools are, government funded schools are nothing but indoctrination camps. You know what I'm saying? That's, that's what kids get indoctrinated right there in, my, in, the, in those classrooms. And my dad, a public school teacher, he even know because the teachers are forced to teach certain things and they have to go about certain agendas. Uh, so when I think of school choice, I just go straight to homeschooling personally um, because you, you can't really trust people, especially in this day and age. So it benefits the students because a parent's be able to choose what they want to do with their children. Absolutely. You know what I'm saying? Yep. So obviously that benefits the students. And how does it benefit uh, the teachers? Well, if teachers go into other things like uh, uh, other types of schools, then they wouldn't have to worry about the government forcing views on them to teach the children. Um, there, there's teachers that got all these pride flags up in their classrooms, uh, but if you do something that opposes that, you can't, it's not the same. So, um, yeah, but I really care about the students more than I care about the teachers, no disrespect. Right, but we do need the teachers, and it's important that we understand what the teachers are dealing with when it comes to the teachers' unions, and my, you're right. That is one, so I understand. Absolutely, you're absolutely right when it comes to how they dictate um, you know, even the style of the teachers. Mm -hmm. So it's very important. Um, how does it affect the black community, though? Um, I haven't been uh, raised up going to a segregated school. Uh, we are basically, during that time, it was one step above slavery. Mm -hmm. And so we got the second best uh, as far as education was concerned. And education being the gateway for the opportunity that America affords and what we're dealing with now is that first they wouldn't let us in, and now they won't let us out, because we should, it, it should be called parent choice and not school choice, because it should be the decision of the parents as to where they want to send their kids for the best kind of education that they should have. And what is happening is that in the public schools, they keep claiming that the charter schools and things like that are taking away their money. That, that money is taxpayers' money, mm -hmm. and so it should be competitive our kids are being held hostage by a system that's failing them, and the results of it you can see right now in what's happening in America. Our leadership is not what it should be because our education system is not what it should be. We should go back to classical education where we teach, where we teach our kids how to discuss things, 
how to have uh, conversations as opposed to council culture and things like that, such as uh, critical race theory, which is nothing more than a theory. So uh, the parents have to get more involved with their kids to make sure that they have the best opportunity to be, be successful in this great uh, United States of America. Absolutely. Very well said. It's, it's important that we understand when it comes to school choice, the fight is with the parents. The parents need to step up. Um, and there's something that you spoke, you spoke to. It really speaks to me when you said they wouldn't let us in and now they won't let us out. It's, it's very profound. So um, we got to make sure that they are teaching our children how to think and not what to think. I have another question. So how does the lack of school choice affect uh, what well, we already went over that. So uh, do you feel that there is a false narrative surrounding the topic of school choice? Osiga. Uh, yes, I think that uh, the people uh, that would push a false narrative are the, are the very people that want to keep uh, the government complacent in the way that things are. Uh, I think that it's a, it's a side of, let's say, a political movement or rather a government uh, type of movement that you want certain funding staying here and certain kids staying here. So it's just a, uh, a general type of like flow. Uh, they talk about, you know, the school to prison pipeline and things like that and, and those other uh, theories and some that really come to be fact. So I think uh, as far as uh, in that, that um, that's where, you know, the lack is in short, uh, I think that like I said, if you remove that incentive, uh, it creates a monopoly, which is what the government, you know, is kind of headed forward to, which is why we need, you know, free markets and give parents hope and at least a say in their child's education. Because if you don't, then it turns into an indoctrination camp in short, um, at the very least. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. The lack of school choice dispropor disproportionately affects uh, the black American community. Um, so our next topic is entrepreneurship and free markets. How would you define entrepreneurship and free markets? Um, so free market to me is, 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 is the freedom to trade. Mm -hmm. Everything in life is a trade. Everything in life is economy. You know what I'm saying? You trade time. Like when you go to a job, you're trading that eight hours a day for whatever money they give you. But it's the freedom to choose that rather than being forced to do it. Yes. You see what I'm saying? Um, so, and that, to me, that's the only way to have a successful nation, as we see currently. Um, and entrepreneurship is to strive within that market. You know what I'm saying? Uh, the, the knowledge to strive into that market. And there's many ways to do it. <coughs> obviously, obviously, my way to do it is through music. Mm -hmm. um, it's not your traditional business model. Um, like, cause I, I decided to invest in myself. Mm -hmm. I'm a one-man band, no record label. Well, I am signed to Jesus Christ, but mm, I love it. Um, no <laughs> record label. Um, it's just me. I'm in my I'm in my room making my music, editing videos. I shoot my own videos, like literally a one man shop. I invested in the cameras. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. I invested in the microphone. I invested in the in the PCs. I invested in all. I invested over a hundred thousand dollars in my own music. You know what I'm saying? And I bet it on myself, and I bet it correctly. Uh, and you know, we got some success from it. <coughs> Black excellence. I ain't got to make music about um, degeneracy, drugs, Absolutely. smoking, it, sex. Yeah. You ain't got to do that to be successful. Um, we talk about black excellence. I feel like I'm a prime example of you can do it a different way. Absolutely. Um, speaking of black excellence, I have a question for you, Bryson. So um, how do you feel that your, your music specifically promotes and celebrates black excellence? To show an alternative. Because right now when you see black people on TV, what are they? Cardi B, she ain't even black, but whatever. <laughs> you, see, you, see, you see her on TV or Meg Thee Stallion. You know what I'm saying? Who the, who the men you see? You see NBA young boy, mm -hmm. future, future like 40, year old, 40 years old telling you to pop pills. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? Jay-Z, Beyonce, they're both satanic, clearly. Right. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? So everybody feel like to make it in music, if you have any musical talent, people feel like you have to make it that way. You know what I'm saying? I don't know if you watched the Grammys recently, but black people, this is what they look to. You know what I'm saying? So they don't have an alternative is that is future black excellence? You see what I'm saying? Right. So I feel like we see people like me, not only me, even people like Topher. We, we doing it in a different way, a different lane, clean music. I don't use not a not no profanity in my music. So I'm like that is black excellence because this is this is what black people should be. Right. You should be looking at future. Look at people like this. You know what I'm saying? And plus, mm -hmm. I feel like um, hip hop. Right. That's that's the culture we, we we all come from. Right. So 
Yeah, hip hop is supposed to be counterculture. It was never meant to to go along with the narrative. You see what I'm saying? Right. Not not the people I used to listen to. Not the Tupacs. They didn't go they didn't go with the narrative. They went against the narrative. That's why they were so controversial. Um, so I'm like, nowadays people go with the narrative and teach your kids to put on a dress like Young Thug. You know what I'm saying? Make them homos and all that nonsense. So I feel like we're just providing a, a, a different way to do it. And I feel like that's the embodiment. That's the embodiment of uh, Black Excellence. Love it. Very true. You spoke about how the media perpetuates negative stereotypes of the black community. What are some ways that you guys think that we, should, we can combat that outside of music, outside of entertainment? Oh, well, I think uh, as far as if you talk about conservative uh, movement or just in general is uh, kind of what Bryson is doing, actually exactly what Bryson is doing, but in many different industries. Uh, so whether it's media, whether it's business, whether it's stores, uh, if we look at like a lot of e-commerce sites, I guess that Pride Month is coming up. Watch how quickly a lot of them show those rain, you know, rainbow colors and, and flags and things like that. And we don't have, uh, I guess, a great market share of different conservative companies or they're scared to speak out. I think that is where we can kind of fight back in a sense and also supporting those companies that support our values. Uh, kind of like a, a famous saying that the uh, the Jewish community goes by, you know, their dollar it takes, it never leaves their community. They if they go to you know a dentist, they're going to go to a Jewish dentist. They're going to go to a Jewish lawyer, and they're going to go doctor, uh, whether it's uh, items and whatnot. Uh, so I think that's uh, one thing you should look at is who the companies or the entities that you you are supporting, and yeah, when if you buy from them, you are supporting them. Uh, you just look where look where your money's going and your support and your your time. Love it, absolutely. Um, I actually think that you said something important, and, and so did you, when it comes to uh, black excellence and just economic prosperity. You have to invest in yourself, just like he invested in himself. We have to invest in ourselves as far as businesses, as well as mentally and spiritually. Uh, we have to invest in ourselves and be the change that we want to see. So uh, another question I have, uh, for those struggling in whatever situation they found themselves in, first steps, uh, what are some first steps that they can take to uh, take advantage of the free market society? Well, the first thing we have to understand is that it's not where you come from, it's where you're going. It's not what's behind you, nor in front of you, it's what's in you. Unfortunately, entrepreneurship, uh, free market is not taught in our school system. So again, as I said before, they're holding our uh, kids hostage. And we need to understand that it's indoctrination as opposed to education. So, for example, when Bryson was talking about music, uh, our music is a, is, is a great solution of how we overcame because they want to tell us that, uh, for example, the song, We Shall Overcome, I don't sing that song. My Bible tells me I'm an overcomer by the blood of the Lamb, the word of my testimony. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. So we have to stop allowing others to come into our community and tell us how we're supposed to live. We have to understand that we think as individuals, not as Joe Biden said, we're monolithic. Uh, each one of us on this stage has different ideas. And we, as individuals, we focus those ideas on how to improve things. So we are in a situation right now where uh, we need to go back to uh, strengthening the black family. There's been a design to eliminate the black family through uh, the Great Society, where they came up with the welfare situation where they said that in order for the black woman to receive a welfare check, the man no longer had to be in, could be in the house. So, uh, and actually, out of the government became a husband. So now, uh, as, as Bryson was saying a few minutes ago, uh, we have to go back to what manhood is and not be the mouse of the house and make sure the people understand that we are well able to perform as well as anybody else. Absolutely. We can't allow people to come into our communities and tell us who we are and what we can do. Uh, do we believe a lack of knowledge about our accomplishments and history um, has led to the black community being backwards in our view as far as our contributions to this mm -hmm. country? Yes. Perfect example was Black Wall Street. Everybody knows about Black Wall Street, right? Everybody in here. But I bet you didn't know it got rebuilt for five years mm -hmm. with the help of a black lawyer. I bet you, I bet you, ninety percent of people don't know that aspect of it. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? Right. People don't know about the success because it is, you know, it's it's it's, it's fi financially beneficial to keep us in this victim mindset. 
it's beneficial for them to do so. That, that's why every black movie you see in the movie theater got something to do with Emmett Till or slavery. The Emmett Till movie was good, by the way. I wanted to go see it. It, it, was, it was good. But, you know what I'm saying? If, if I was a, not who I was, I'd be angry when I left there. Because mm-hmm. Emmett Till wasn't that long ago. Right. But see, they pick, they, they literally invest in keeping us like that, keeping us emotional. Every time something bad happens, another example is 52, 52 white people got, unarmed white people got killed by the police last year. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. 36 black people got killed by unarmed police last year. I've heard a few of the black ones. Mm-hmm. We ain't heard about the white ones, though. Mm-hmm. Because it's not financially beneficial for them to talk about that. Right. The, new, the, new, the news, literally, the, the media, pe- these people invest in keeping us, keeping us down. So if we knew the truth about our real history, about all the successful people that came up. Like, why is Jay-Z telling you you oppressed? Why? Right. He, he should be somebody people like, okay, he did it, we can do it. But instead, he tell you, oh, we're going to do oppression, this and this and this. I'm telling you, these, these people, it, it's beneficial for them to keep us like that. So um, I do think it's a, uh, not only are we uneducated, we're miseducated. I think it's a beautiful thing uh, happening in our culture, in our society today. When I look at people like you and, and Osiga and other young people and also our elders here, um, it's, it's, a, it's a great awakening happening where we see that these things are being done by design. So the fact that we can see that they're creating these movies that perpetuate the victim mentality, now we can say, you know what, we see your game, we see what you're doing, now we're not gonna play it anymore. I'm gonna invest in myself, I'm gonna have a victim mentality, and I'm gonna make sure that everything that happens in my life, I have personal responsibility about it, okay? So, I wanna move on to our next topic. Uh, This is my favorite topic because I'm very much solution-oriented as opposed to being problem-conscious, but we have to also be conscious of our problems, but solution-oriented gets us where we wanna go. Um, Black History Month, it's been confined to the shortest month of the year. Do you feel that a lot of black achievements and advancements are overlooked in this short amount of time, Clarence? Uh, Black history is 12 months of the year, 365, 24 hours, because we've been such a viable part of building this country. And you go back and you look at people like Frederick Douglass, like Harriet Tubman, that overcame all odds. And so we begin to understand that it's such a rich history that we are the ones that teach people how to, they're supposed to live, not out of hate, but out of love. And one thing was said before is our people perish from the lack of knowledge. And so the history of what we have done shows that uh, we can take advantage of the opportunity because when you, when you look at the, the free market capitalistic system, it doesn't care who owns it. So they're not teaching us that. And it says that if you're going to prosper in any system of economy, you've got to understand how, how it works. In America, we had a free market capitalist system which says that all you need is a product or a service that people need or want. If you have a distribution system to get that product or service out there, you actually become wealthy. But those kind of things are not being taught in our society. So as a result, uh, our kids don't understand who the real heroes are, are the people that have step out and say, I will compete rather than compare, and I will show you on the game field of life how I can be very productive. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, you, you are a, a key figure in the civil rights movement. When it comes to black, the idea of black, black excellence, how do you think that the civil rights leaders embodied that? Well, they embodied it by understanding there's a thing called due process of law, and that's how it is to be done, because in in order for us to remain a free society, we have to self-discipline ourselves that we do things according to the the rule of law, and if a a law is unjust, we have a way to change that law. Uh, For example, uh, I was always told that I I was not uh, aware enough to be in business for myself, but I was a business myself for almost 30 years, teaching mortgages, investments, and things like that. And so when given the opportunity, we can, we can very well change things. And the new civil rights movement is economic empowerment. Money is a game that everybody plays, but most people lose the game because they don't understand how money works. And so we need to understand things like financial liter- literacy, how to budget, uh, how to uh, uh, but look at our, our needs versus our wants. Our needs come first and our wants come second. So they keep trying to indoctrinate us to hold us down. And, 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 and you know, during this day and time, that when you find people that can't read, then they need to go back and look at what they did to the slaves. They said, it is against the law for you to learn how to read. And so we need to have, learn how to read and, 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 and do the things that 
we need to do to become successful. As a matter of fact, in school right now, they don't teach history as a requirement. They don't teach civics as a requirement. Cursive is out. How do you how do you sign your name and you can't do cursive? So mm -hmm. we've got to understand what we need to do to be successful within this society. Absolutely. Personal responsibility, uh, that's the key. When the education fails, it's, it's upon the parents and the community and also us as individuals to make sure that we pick up the slack. Uh, it's interesting, you said something very profound before when you said that as a community right now, we, we buy, uh, we pay for what we want and we beg for what we need. And that's something that we really have to change, especially when it comes to relying on others external to us, like the government um, and other entities to provide our needs. So, um, cool. So <laughs> are there any other parts of black history being, you know, a part of the civil rights movement and just even your history learning growing up uh, that you believe have become lost? We need to study to show ourselves approved because we have people, for example, that uh, the stoplight, when we put up the stoplight, who did that was a black guy. We, can, we need to look at how every opportunity we've had to excel, we need to excel in. So we, have, we will excel in because we, so therefore we need to study the history of, the, of black people in this country to see people, like I said, Harriet Tubman, uh, what they did to be successful. We need to study people like uh, George Washington Carver and, and people like that to see how they became very, very successful. The guy that started Tuskegee Institute, for example, uh, one of the things when you went to Tuskegee Institute, you had to help build the, the houses there for, for, for education and also places to live. So, uh, believe it or not, he went into trying to make bricks. He failed three times. On the fourth time, he was so successful, other people came to him to want to buy his bricks. So, when you read that rich history and understand what, uh, how we can compete, mm -hmm. then we begin to change our ideas. Our heroes are not. Uh, athletes or uh, entertainers and such. It's on the business side of that, much like Bryson was talking about, how we've been taking advantage of uh, being the ones out front doing all the work but not getting paid because they don't understand the business side of it. Absolutely. So uh, uh, for us, we have to realize that, again, that the door is open. We don't have to ask permission. We just go walk right in. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Osiga, what are some um, solutions that you feel we can... Um, we can yeah. What are some solutions when it comes to school choice, entrepreneurship, sure. or free market systems? Mm -hmm. So when I think of uh, problem solving as a solution, I, I like to uh, think in the most simplest in terms. So uh, I guess the the goal is is clear. So one thing that about the black community that I would say is we, uh, what, what's a nice way of saying, uh, waste time on frivolous arguments such as, Oh, that we have the shortest day of the of we had the shortest month of the year and things like that. Um, but one thing that that does stick uh, to me when I think of uh, youth today and just in general is is reading, mm -hmm. and that's a simple concern. A lot of a lot of black youth read below grade level, and uh, when you have a, a literacy rate that's low, uh, what do you have on, to rely on for information? You have uh, the the mass media, or like just other sources that they can tell you something that is just face value, but you don't look, you don't question it. Uh, so one thing is also the culture, the culture of um, it's not looked highly upon to, let's say, read books or uh, be proper, uh, you know, speak properly and, and things like that. Uh, but one thing is, is the course of reading. I, I think that's simple. And as far as action, uh, one thing that I've tried to do in my community is uh, through nonprofits where, you know, I have one where we encourage youth in the community to uh, read books and we uh, incentivize them through a monetary reward. Uh, so basically we pay uh, impoverished children to, to read books in hopes that it gets them reading. Because most, most kids, if you ask them uh, if they like to read books, they frown, they say it's boring. And it's just so sad. And you know the saying, uh, there's a saying that goes, uh, if you want to hide information from a black man, put it in a book. Mm -hmm. And it's, it, I'm seeing it, it's just more and more common uh, these days. Uh, so I think that's, that's a solution. I think it's clear cut, simple to understand uh, as far as culture and, and just reading and looking into things. Absolutely, yeah. absolutely. Bryson, do you think that we should have a Black History Month? 
No, black, black history is a part of American history, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Slavery is a part of American history. You know what I'm saying? So black history should like, like, like you said, 24-7. Mm -hmm. That is black history. It contributes mm -hmm. so much to this country. And I just want to add something to the solutions. First thing we need to do in this country is Proverbs 28, 13. We need to confess and forsake our sins because this country is a very simple country. Um, and outside of that, the, the only way to truly change the trajectory that we're on is to change culture. Mm -hmm. It's the only way to do it. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's simple, but it's difficult because we don't have the resources like the children of Satan have. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. First John chapter three, verse ten. Mm -hmm. People are children of Satan. Mm -hmm. um, and we don't have the we don't have the resources on this earth that, that they have, right? So we gotta come together and push people up that's that, that give something different. Mm -hmm. Like I said earlier, the thing the thing that's being pushed, who do you think who do you think funding Cardi B to be on all the radio stations? Mm -hmm. Who do you think funding NBA young boy to paint his nails and I think he just came out saying he's Mormon or something. Weirdo, mm -hmm. you know what I'm saying? Like this, this stuff is funny. Like, so my song "Let's Go Brandon" was number 29 on the Billboard charts. You know how much money I invested in that? How much? This much. Zilch. Um, nothing. Nada. Zero dollars. Do you know how much money labels put into artists to get them on the top 40 on Billboard charts? A lot. Payola. Two hundred thousand, two hundred and fifty thousand. That's the low end right there, mm -hmm. and, that, and that's for hip hop. A pop movie might get up to three hundred and fifty, five hundred thousand. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. So they invest in this. So we have to create an alternative to what's happening. You know, a lot of conservatives they, they spend a lot of their time um, spot pitting a spotlight on the degeneracy that happens, like the Grammys. I posted about it a few times too, but that's all they do because it's clicks. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? They gonna promote you, Sam Smith. I, I, I don't even I didn't know he dropped a new song. I, I found out because of conservatives. Mm -hmm. I mm -hmm. found out because of Christians. Mm -hmm. You see what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. So why don't we take that energy, just chill for a little bit, I understand clicks, I understand post. I'm not saying don't post about it. Right. But just take that same energy and provide an alternative because these are the people influencing the youth. Unfortunately, pe people don't look up to people like Ben Carson or Clarence Henderson as they should. Mm -hmm. You see what I'm saying? They look up to the athletes, like he said. They look up to the, the celebrities, the Jay-Zs, and people like that. These people don't care about politics. Right. All they know is hip hop and, and some forms of fashion. So you have to provide an alternative if you want to reach them. Wow, that's powerful. It's um, obviously accurate and based. Um, based, very based. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, it's important for us to understand that. And, and you know, you spoke about creating alternatives and, and highlighting people that are, are doing the right things, especially when it comes to the black community. And culture is, is a big, big part of that. Mm -hmm. It's a huge part of that. So when it comes to having Black History Month, mm -hmm. I think, and, you know, obviously I personally don't think that we should have a Black History Month. I'm in the, you know, of the mind that Black History Month is 12 months a year. But now that we do have it, what are some things that we can do to uh, highlight, you know, th those that are not highlighted and really just change the culture in that way? Get people like Clarence Hanson on TikTok. <laughs> yeah, yeah, somebody make him a page stat <laughs> to tell his story so, so, so the youth will know. A lot of people, these youth, that's all they know is this internet stuff. So we gotta we gotta reach some we gotta reach some type of people. Don't worry about it. I, I'm, I'm gonna go clip up all, all your stuff and we are gonna get it on TikTok. Let people know the true history. Cause we, we got history alive, like you said earlier. Right. History, Absolutely. History is right in front of us. You oh, know yeah. what I'm right in front of us. You so know, we we just gotta teach people about about the true history. Like even with Frederick Douglass, people don't even know how he learned how to read. You, do you know how he learned how to read? He learned how to read because the poor white folk, he gave them food and they taught him how to read. Mm -hmm. You see yeah. what I'm saying? We, we need to learn how to overcome because our history is a, his, uh, a history of overcoming. Mm -hmm. We just don't know it. Right. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. We got to be more proactive, um, especially when it comes to what we what we choose to amplify. There are a lot of uh, we do a lot of as conservatives reactions to what those who are on the other side are doing. But we should be actively trying to conserve conservative values. So so that's really important. Um, question from the audience. Osiga, as a child of immigrants, what do you think black American culture can learn from black immigrant culture? Uh, well, I think um, when it comes to that, uh, I was raised, uh, yes, by immigrant parents. And one thing that uh, it would always stick out was uh, mainly two things, gratitude, discipline, and hard work. So uh, one thing that you would see, and not to compare, uh, different people, but it would be mainly comparing, let's say, Americans with, you know, foreigners. And we would 
be grateful in a sense that we would think that we were very lucky to be here and privileged. And it's the same analogy when you think of like, let's say a rich kid versus a, 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 a poorer kid, right? You think the rich kid is, is spoiled and they have it all put together and you're just like, wow, his life is so great. Now the rich kid thinks that they're depressed or that they don't have it all or they don't have, let's say they didn't get the blue car uh, for Christmas or something like that and they wanted the, you know, then they got a white car instead or something like that. So that's the way that uh, America, in that sense, we're the rich kids in, in that sense. We're the, we're the privileged kids and we, we take things for, for granted. So I think a lot of immigrants, they, they come into the U.S. and they have like that chip on their shoulder to work hard and things don't bother, bother them, like things like microaggressions or certain emotions or, or things like that. So, and it's just the discipline, you know, because when you, when you, when you come uh, from, like my father, he came from Nigeria. All he, all he knew was just to study and to work hard. He didn't really have the distractions uh, that most Americans face. And his mindset was different. I think it just, it just comes down to mindset and yeah, culture plays a factor into that. But once you are, you just have gratitude in life, uh, it, it definitely helps a lot. And that's what I think a lot of Americans lack, not just, you know, black Americans. And it gives somebody an advantage once they're, they're grateful for something and they work hard for something and they're disciplined and they don't indulge in everything that's popular. Mm -hmm. If you look at uh, Americans, there's a common uh, term of keeping up with the Joneses, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and, it, and it cripples a lot of Americans because it, it puts them into debt. It puts them into worrying about things that don't matter. Uh, it makes them, you know, try and, yeah, keep up with the Joneses. And a lot of immigrants don't, they don't have that need or really aren't even aware of, you know, that, that concept. So it gives them an advantage uh, so one thing I would say, and, and this is the thing that I apply in business as well, which helps a lot of entrepreneurs, is that if you have a habit of going against the grain, and right now America is so degenerate that if you do the opposite of what others are doing in America or in a wayward country, you're, you're already going to be successful in a sense. Like think about what the average American does. Uh, goes into debt, goes into college, uh, studies, uh, uh, let's say like, Lesbian dance theory, they'll take a loan for $100,000. When they get out of college, uh, they're surprised that nobody's hiring lesbian dance theories. And then they run to the politicians that, that lie to them and say, that, oh, we're going to cancel debt. And they don't even do, do the math uh, that that's really not possible. Or like, let's say healthy lifestyle, right? Fast food, you know, uh, the average American consumes a lot of unhealthy fast foods and, and things like that. Uh, but the immigrant will cook at home. And, you know, and then think about things like, like saving money uh, as too as well. A lot of immigrants, they would save money because they're thinking about other people other than themselves, which is their family back home, their current family. And there's not that need to be cool. Um, so I, I would say it's, it's just a matter of, of just gratitude and not having that need to keep up with the Joneses. That's, that's just the simple first step. Uh, to, and then, yeah, putting your pride aside. You'll be surprised, like, how much pride that Americans have. Like, when I do, like, uh, consulting as far as, biz as business consulting or, like, let's say, you know, career or, or next step, I'll give somebody a suggestion, like, oh, why don't you, while, while you're starting up your business, I see you're, you have a few clients, why don't you take some, up some night shifts at a local bar or something? And they'll say, oh, I don't want to be a waiter or a waitress. You know, they'll immediately say that and, and they're broke. You know, their next bill is due and they're they're all high and mighty. And a lot of these entrepreneurs, they don't they don't, you know, have that. What helps them, they don't have that pride that holds them back. Like uh, like Bryson, for example, Bryson's not above uh, doing a lot of work. Me, for example, with the uh, the home care agencies my family has, I, w I would never have guessed that my first quarter million would come from uh, helping old women and old uh, grandparents. Uh, use the bathroom and cleaning up after them, you know? Uh, and that's another thing that ties into business. It's not always the flashy business. There's always the boring businesses, the, the dirty jobs that need to be done, the skills and trades. And I think that's what hurts a lot of uh, Americans today in a, in a privileged country as this. Everybody wants to have that, that flashy job or let's say be a content creator like me. 
I accidentally became a content creator, and 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 that's not even my favorite thing to do. And I I, I don't. I don't even really try, but there's so many people that would that would try on that, and and that's not even my bread and butter. So like whether or not I gain followers or lose followers or my algorithm goes off, I'm I'm still good because I had you know my bread and butter, which was a quote unquote uh, boring business. Mm-hmm. And I think that's just uh, you know I've said a, said a lot, but I hope you guys stay with me. <laughs> but uh, that's uh, that's as far as what I think is just the, the mentality, uh, the culture, and and, and discipline. And uh, yeah, uh, absolutely. Thank you for sharing, Osiga. Um, yeah, when it comes to the immigrants uh, versus African Americans, the main distinction is the value system and, and the w- the willingness to do hard work. So um, what you said is very based <laughs> and uh, very accurate. So Bryson, Osiga, and Mr. Clarence here—they're all from the same areas of North Carolina. Our guests, are, I'm sorry, our audience wants to know how much success do you attribute to? your communities? Well, in a way, it has to be all of it, right? Outside of God, of course, that's where my family's from. My dad grew up in High Point, North Carolina, in every ghetto you can think of, Section 8, government cheese. Um, that's, how, that's how my dad grew up, and he beat all of them odds. Um, he, he was an electrical engineer, lost a job, went to school, and now he's been a teacher for like, shit, over 20 years. He's won Teacher of the Year. He's literally on the on like on the Hall of Fame in High Point, North Carolina, and that's my parents is who instilled all this in me. Plus, I think I just was born with a couple screws loose. But uh, <laughs> <laughs> so it, it, that that's from the soil of that area. You know what I'm saying? Um, so I, I, I feel like almost all of it has to come from there because that's where everything that instilled in me at High Point, North Carolina. Mm-hmm. What about you, Mr. Clarence? Um, North Carolina has such a rich history. Uh, of course, we still have King Roy as the governor, but we also have Mark Robinson, yes. a black person who is a lieutenant governor. Mm-hmm. And uh, he's, again, showing that uh, when the opportunity presents itself, we can compete. We have uh, outstanding universities there like uh, A&T State University, Bennett College, uh, some great things have come out of there, sports. Uh, one of the guys was a, a, a part of uh, uh, going to the moon, and he lost his life. So we have such a rich mm-hmm. history there. And, for example, my father, when he moved uh, to Greensboro from South Carolina, he was a uh, tenant farmer. And he came to Greensboro and never worked for anybody but himself mm-hmm. because he had a talent of uh, repairing cars. And when he heard, if he heard it run, he could fix it. So... Uh, those kind of individuals that have lived in Greensboro and worked through the community to make uh, us successful. Uh, and uh, back uh, when I was growing up, one of the biggest things we had is that we had husband and wives, black husband and wives working together to become successful. So, uh, and Greensboro and North Carolina right now is the uh, proving ground for the United States of America as to which way we go, whether we go with the D or the, uh, or the R. And uh, we see a lot of people coming in trying to change the values of North Carolina, but the values of North Carolina uh, sort of helped set the tone. And then being in the South, which was so backwards in the beginning, is so forward now. So we have a lot of people instead of moving. When I, my idea was to move north, a lot of northern people's ideas to move south to, 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 to places like North Carolina. So North Carolina is successful because of, of the communities that we have developed there and the type of business we have. It's one of the, greatest business business states that there is. Mm. Wow. We have some great people from, from the Carolinas here. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, how does, first of all, I want to know, what is what is your personal definition of black excellence, Bryson? Um, I mean, just take the definition of excellence and slap a black person on it. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but I don't know, it's, like I said, in, in this country, we actually were oppressed at one point in time. You see what I'm saying? Right. So like I said earlier, I feel like black excellence is an example of overcoming, not crying about the injustices that was done, because it wasn't even done to me or Osega, it was done to people like people like Perrin, not not us, you know what I'm saying? We, I haven't been through that. <clears throat> but he's an example of overcoming, of standing up for something. The, the, the sit-ins were, were an example of standing up for something. You know what I'm saying? Right. Black Wall Street getting a review after five years, using a black lawyer with the help of a black lawyer after the courts rejected them multiple times. That's an example of overcoming something. So to me, black excellence in the United States of America is overcoming. Love that. Absolutely. 
Um, my, no one's asking me, but I, I just want to share my, my version of what I think black excellence is, which is, is really, like you said, it's, it's slapping the word black on top of excellence. It is overcoming or perseverance and resilience, but it's also leadership. It's also, uh, you know, the accomplishments and achievements that we are accomplishing in today's time, like here right now, um, which is something that we, we don't focus on. We always focus on the past. Um, you know, obviously it's thrown in our faces, but we, we need to understand that uh, black excellence is, is here live and in the flesh, right? Yeah. Um, May I so, answer that question? Also? Absolutely. Sure. Um, it starts with character. Uh, that's the foundation. As a matter of fact, I've written a program called Content of Character because America will always look like the content of the character of its people. And so the morality and all these kind of things that we're dealing with right now, uh, black excellence is showing that we as a people, even though we've gone through all these things that we've gone through, as a matter of fact, I had a lady ask me one time, she said, if everything would have happened to me, uh, she wanted to know why I didn't hate white people. Well, I have no hate in me. What I do is I teach people how they are supposed to act. And then I had uh, a, a, a preacher tell me that uh, if, it, if he would have been me, he probably would have joined the Black Panthers. But that's not the, the uh, again, we have to think individually. How do we strategically move from point A to point B? So it starts with character. And I have, a, for example, I have a nephew that, that uh, he can't stay out of trouble. As a matter of fact, he's in jail right now. And I told him two things. First, the first thing is that the reason why you need to stop uh, being in jail trying to steal, you're not good at it. That's mm -hmm. the first thing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the mm -hmm. second thing is that if you figure out how to stay out of trouble, everything else will work out for itself. Because I sit here on this stage, I don't even have a birth certificate. But yet, I've taken advantage of all the opportunities that have come along. And, and uh, I've been in the, in the military. I have spent 16 months at Fort Rook, Alabama when, I was, uh, when George Wise was the governor. So I've been through a lot of things that people don't understand. How do we live to fight for another day. It's like uh, the, 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 the uh, song, The Gambler. You got to know when to hold them, you got to know when to fold them, you got to know when to walk away and when to run. Every fight is not your fight. You mm -hmm. have to pick and choose how you're going to be most effective. It's just like what Paul did in the, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the Bible. He picked and chose those things that he would participate in. And so we have to understand now uh, how not to, everything that comes up uh, that we don't try to accord a public opinion. We look at due process of how we uh, make things better and stop destroying things. We're made to build up and not tear down. Absolutely. Absolutely. Thank you for adding that. Um, so you spoke about, as far as we're talking about the achievement of black excellence, right? So we talked about reading books, you know, intellectualizing ourselves. We talked about the content of character. But how do we shift the mindset, which is really the, the, one of the most important things when it comes to changing who you are and, and you know, walking in your greatness? Anyone can answer this question. Oh, I, I think uh, purely just being being an example. Uh, one thing that I realize is that uh, now these days, uh, ever since like you know I've uh, reached a certain milestone in business uh, and just success and just uh, as far as achievement, a lot of my friends, you know, they they they've kind of quieted down and they slowly you know come and listen to me uh, as far in things like in things as matters of, let's say, growing up, right? Mm -hmm. If they want to build their credit or start a business, they've slowly now come to me before when I wasn't, you know, that example. It was a little bit harder, but now that they see that, so if you see more people do, doing this, for example, like media has a big play in this. You see, you know, on TV, uh, sports, you know, professional sports, hip hop. So that's what people will look, you know, not just, yeah, not just young people, but people in general will look up to, mm -hmm. and that's all they know. But if you see more examples of that, it, it does help. Uh, and I think that the just more examples of that and being around that helps. Like, for example, the, a common uh, thing around the black community is a lack of, you know, father, fathers in the home. And uh, and it's not it's not just that, you know, it's a lack of um, like it's coming back to discipline and coming back to uh, you don't have to follow the crowd and everything because uh, the crowd you know the crowd will hurt you the crowd is not always right especially in America the way we're, we're going now uh, but it just it just comes down to being being a good example and people seeing the fruits of your labor uh, and they slowly you know reach out to you as far as that so I think it, it needs to it needs to be highlighted more uh, like Bryson said uh, we need more you know Clarence Henderson's out in uh, in our 
will highlight in our community because they are there, you know, and we need to stop that mentality. But that just comes with, I guess, the, the man in the mirror uh, in general. And um, yeah, I think that's just in short. Love it. Let Thank me you. share with you something on that very briefly. We have all of these projects across the United States. Mm -hmm. Why, and this has been, been a vision of mine, and we worked on it for a while, is why not have educational programs within these projects where the people that live there that may not have the funds to catch their budget or whatever, they can have uh, 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 classes in there, teaching business and all those kind of things, financial literacy and all those kind of things, so we can do it directly on sites because those places sit there and uh, they could be more productive and uh, they're being funded already, so it's just a matter of those people that want to participate and uh, move from where they are, they can have those classes on site. And it's important that as a community, we take advantage of things like that. Uh, so any final thoughts, Bryson? Um, I'd like to add a little bit to what Osea said about examples. We do have to be examples. I mean, look at it like this. I basically, I basically popularize an entire new genre of music and they have a lot of people joining it. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? That, that used to do secular music. They used to pick poison. Like, like my music used to pick poison. We used to perform at middle schools. They're going crazy singing, and my music was about women shaking their butts. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. And you used to watch kids sing it, but it didn't. It wasn't crazy at first because you still got a worldly mentality. So once you break out of that, you're like, I cannot believe we were doing that. So you, so you have to be an example and show people that there's another way because a lot of people, they're going to flock to what, works. You know what I'm saying? Right. So I popularizes popularizes this new genre of music. Now we got a whole lane full of them. Now we got people doing concerts all over the place. Y'all have them on Saturday. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. it, it, and it's, it's positive it's positive music. I have people that DM me all the time and say they don't even listen to secular rap no more. Wow. Be because they had an alternative. If there's no alternative, they're gonna stick with you know what they have. Because people like music. Um so so like just to add to what I was said we have to, we have to be examples and and stop glorify, glorifying terrible things, stop glorifying the positive truth. Absolutely. Like we always say, be the change you want to see. Mm -hmm. Where can people find you on social media? I'm Bryson Gray. Uh, wherever I'm not banned at, you just type that in and maybe I'll come up soon. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, Mr. Mr. Clarence Henderson, do you have a website or any uh, means of how people can reach you? Uh, you? They simply have to look at the name. Okay. And uh, as a matter of fact, I have... Uh, my own website there, and I have one word that uh, we're in the middle of doing a movie production on my life. Uh, wow. I have a book coming out, uh, hopefully in the next uh, couple of months. So if they would look up, just look up my name, they would see all the various things that I've done because I'm one of those persons that believes that your voice needs to be heard, especially if it's a positive voice, and they're trying to shut us down to keep us from... Uh, hearing the things we need to hear. And so as far as the Frederick Douglass Foundation is concerned, it's uh, uh, fdfnc.org. Uh, as far as the Frederick Douglass Foundation is concerned, we're doing some great things in the state of North Carolina. Uh, we are a, a grassroots uh, organization that looks to be the voice for the voiceless, and uh, especially with things like uh, parent choice, uh, abortion, uh, these various things that uh, e equality for all, except uh, uh, limited quality, equality for all, and, and teaching people what you need to do between your dash, your date of birth and your date of death. Mm. Because when you look at the Bible, Bryson, uh, for example, the oldest person I see in the Bible is Methuselah, but I don't see anything he did. So it's not how long you live, it's what you do. So we have these positive influences, and I just want to leave a legacy of uh, teaching our people a great price that we pay as far as this um, America is concerned and how not to go back from where we came because they're trying to put a whole of America, black, white, red, and yellow, into economic slavery, and we cannot allow that to happen. Absolutely. Thank you. Osiga, do you have any social media that you would like to share with the audience that they could follow you on? Oh, yeah, yeah. I, mean, I guess it, we, I have one of those, I guess. <laughs> so uh, uh, it would be uh, at Osiga on all platforms. Uh, but I don't want to shine uh, too much light on myself. I find more fulfillment in uh, my most recent projects, my nonprofits. Uh, so the first one being Smart Offering. Uh, basically, we help cover the cost for people to start a business or learn a skill or a trade or anything that's a barrier to entry in an industry. 
Uh, we also have a program that has become much more popular called our Read Pay, pro our Read Pay program, where we basically pay impoverished kids to read books anywhere from $1 to $5. And we can be found at smartoffering.org and readpay.org. And um, that's it. Thank you. Thank you, gentlemen. Uh, so the topic has been black excellence. It's thank you all for providing your experience, your wisdom, and your insight. Um, we talked about school choice, the importance of it. We talked about taking advantage of the free market society and capitalist uh, economic society, and as well as solutions, right? So uh, thank you guys. You guys have been amazing today. Uh, don't forget to check out the Frederick Douglass Foundation to learn more about the work that they do with Mr. Clarence Henderson. And uh, thank you all for joining us. We'll see you next time.